Um, remind you what we've what we're talking about just before we went the break. We we're discussing the cardiac output, right? So, cardiac output you can regulate via the heart rate or by the stroke volume. Heart rate is pretty simple. Right? You can make it fast, you can make it slow, that's it. We'll talk how, but fast or slow, and that's... Now, how can you change the stroke volume? Let's let's dive into it a little bit more. So one thing is, we call it a preload. Okay? Um, so preload. What does that mean? It means that... If you stretch the heart more, it will contract stronger. Do you understand? I can give you an analogy, actually. Um, imagine an elastic band. If you stretch it a little and release, it will hit somebody, but not really hard. If you do this, and go all out veggie on someone, it's going to be painful, right? So, same goes for the heart. If heart fills up more, okay, it will contract more. Does that make sense? So, it turns out that when you have more blood coming back from the circulation, okay, venous return is increased. That increases end diastolic volume. And at the same time, end diastolic volume will increase the contractility, will increase the force of contraction. And the more you fill the heart up, the stronger it will contract. Does that make sense to you? So increased and diastolic volume indirectly will decrease and systolic volume. You can see that relationship here. And it's quite interesting that this relationship is not direct. So as you increase and diastolic volume, increased contractility leads to the increase of stroke volume. That makes sense. Does that make sense? So first, you can fill up the heart to the higher level, and that will squeeze out more blood. Second, you may also increase contractility at the given volume. Now, what you have to think here is, let's assume that your end diastolic volume, just assume, is, I don't know, 100 mils. Okay? If, you sque if heart squeezes weakly, then your end systolic volume will be, let's say, 50, right? So EDV, 100, and systolic volume, 50. What's going to be the stroke volume? 50, right? Now, if you increase only the strength of contraction, what's going to change? Here's, so, contractility refers to the same initial volume. So, in, when we talk about contractility, we say, what if end diastolic volume, okay? What if end diastolic volume is the same? But if the heart contracts stronger, ESV will, yeah, let's say it's going to be 40. If you increase it even more, so it's going to be 30. Does that make sense? Each time you increase contractility, you will increase the stroke volume by decreasing ESV. That's the story. Does that make sense? Um, how can you increase contractility? Sympathetic stimulation. All right? That leads to the higher influx of calcium 
into the cells, into the muscle cells. And remember, calcium, in, in case of muscle contraction, uh, calcium interacts with what protein? Does anyone remember? It starts with T. Troponin, yes, it interacts with troponin. So more interaction with troponin, tropomyosin more effectively is shifted from actin, more cross bridges are formed between actin and myosin, contraction is stronger, right? Interestingly enough, parasympathetic system has pretty much no effect on the strength of contraction. Okay? Only sympathetic. Now, if everything comes up to calcium, what will increase the contractility? If contractility depends on the amount of calcium in the cell, what will increase contractility? Exactly. First and foremost, calcium. Okay? If you will take calcium chloride and inject it into someone, the heart will pump stronger. Does that make sense? Okay? Anything that increases the calcium availability, increases calcium transport into the cells. So that would be thyroxine, okay, thyroid hormone, benefrin, the drug known as digitalis, glucagon. Everything that increases calcium either in the cells or first outside of the cells so it can diffuse into them, okay, will increase contractility. Does that make sense? Okay? These agents, the agents that increase calcium concentration and increase strength of contraction are called positive ionotropic agents. You may get a question, something like, what is positive ionotropic agent? Okay, increases strength of contraction, decreases strength of contraction, increases heart rate, decreases heart rate. You have to pick one. Does that make sense? So positive ionotropic agents increase the strength of the heart contraction. Does that make sense? Quite obviously, negative ionotropic agents decrease it. Um, compounds that block calcium channels. Increased extracellular potassium. Acidosis. They all increase contractility. Now, acidosis is a frequent metabolic effect of what disease? Starts with D. Diabetes, yes. It's a, it's a effect of diabetes. And in this case, of course, side effect of acidosis is weaker heart contractions, which will affect the performance and actually will aggravate the um, metabolic acidosis because kidneys won't be able to deal with that. Um, calcium channel blockers. There are drugs that block calcium channels in the heart and reduce the force of contraction. Which disease would they treat? Hypertension, yes. High blood pressure, right? That makes sense. Because if, if, if it decreases the force of contraction, your blood pressure will go down. Now, how can we use the fact that elevated extracellular potassium decreases the force of contraction in the heart? In the United States, it is used. In not all states, but in some, like in Texas. Hmm? Say again? What? Capital punishment. Yeah, death penalty. So, potassium chloride is the component that causes fibrillation of the ventricles. It stops the heart, essentially. I mean, it's not the only one, because there are also drugs to make the person sleep. But the active compound that actually kills the, um, the inmate is potassium chloride. Okay. So, those agents that decrease the force of contraction are negative ionotropic agents. Now, these two things that we discussed, the preload and the contractility, they both contribute to 
when when you have higher preload, so higher end diastolic volume, okay, it increases the stroke volume. Does that make sense? What happens to the cardiac output? It goes, if it increases the stroke volume, what happens to the cardiac output? It goes up. If you increase contractility, what happens to the cardiac output? It goes up. Now, the third factor that affects cardiac output is afterload. It is fairly simple. Okay? It's the pressure that ventricles have to work against. Does that make sense? The higher the blood pressure, the higher end systolic volume, and high end systolic volume means lower stroke volume, which means lower cardiac output. This graph actually shows you very well. Uh, so this is the afterload on the x-axis. This is the stroke volume. So you see that in people with a normal functional heart, stroke volume decreases when they become hypertensive because um, end systolic volume increases as well and stroke volume goes down. But in people with a heart failure, the decrease in stroke volume with increased pressure is much more steep. Okay, So stroke volume goes down really rapidly in people with a moderate heart failure and pretty much plunges in people with a severe heart failure. So these three factors, you have to understand how they contribute to the stroke volume, how they regulate cardiac output. Uh, one thing that I want to mention here, we talked about the athlete and the regular person, talked about at rest, conditions at rest, right? And remember we discussed, we talked, okay, athlete has lower heart rate, but stroke volume is much higher. So overall, lower heart rate does not affect cardiac output. Does that make sense? Because you have two components. Cardiac output equals stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. Okay, so in order, cardiac output has to be maintained at rest at the same level. Does that make sense to you? At rest. So if stroke volume goes down, heart rate will have to go up. Does that make sense? If stroke volume goes up, that heart rate will get decreased. Does that make sense? But when I will ask you questions on the exam or on the quiz, if we increase stroke volume, how it changes cardiac output? You just have to directly think about, okay, if this guy goes up, What's going to happen to cardiac output? Goes up. Okay. If I ask you, if we decrease heart rate, what's going to happen to cardiac output? Goes down. Right? I'm not going to play this this trick game about you know maintaining it at rest. So if one goes up, another one goes down. The same equation. All right. So what regulates heart rate? <clears throat> the components, the chemicals that can regulate the heart rate are called chronotropic okay so you see the ones that regulate the force of contraction are called ionotropic because it's all about calcium the calcium ion the ones that regulate the rate of contraction the frequency are chronotropic because it's about timing right so positive chronotropic example norepinephrine Okay. Negative chronotropic acetylcholine. So essentially, sympathetic regulation is has positive chronotropic effects. It increases heart rate. Parasympathetic system has negative chronotropic effects. Does that make sense? Okay. What else? Thyroxine. Again, calcium. Being younger, being female, 
All of it contributes to the higher heart rate. We good? So you can see that some of the agents like epinephrine, thyroxin, calcium, have both positive chronotropic and positive ionotropic effects. So calcium, thyroxine, epinephrine increase both the rate and the strength of contraction. Right? Negative chronotropic, again, potassium. ACH, being a male, all contributes to the lower heart rate, which isn't bad, per se. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, another way to regulate the heart rate is so-called atrial reflex. So when heart stretches due to the increased venous return, it's the result of exercise is sympathetic stimulation. Okay. Atria feel more, and that atrial feeling increases the stretch of the atrial wall. That stretch of the atrial wall automatically, those mechanoreceptors automatically send the signal to the SA node, stimulate SA node, initiate the contraction. The more you stretch atrial wall, the more frequent the contraction will happen. It's actually quite interesting because it means that the heart cannot slow down infinitely. You see what I'm trying to say? If it feels more, it will try to push out the blood immediately. So it's, it puts a certain limit on how full the blood can be with the blood. How full the heart can be with the blood. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we mentioned that parasympathetic system controls the heart at rest. And we also mentioned the importance of calcium and potassium for the cardiac function. And this table summarizes that in case of hypercalcemia, heart will overwork. Increased heart rate, increased contractility. But in case of hypocalcemia, the heart rate will go down. Okay, and potassium appears to be even more important. If concentration of potassium is too high, it will cause hyperpolarization of the cells, pacemaker cells. When cells become hyperpolarized, they cannot conduct the impulse. It will cause the heart block, and the heart will stop. That's what the uh, capital punishment is based on. Okay. In the hypokalemia, the heartbeat will become very faint. Okay, because there will be no re proper repolarization, okay, and that may cause arrhythmias and also may cause the fibrillation of the ventricles. Does that make sense? Wanted to mention something here, and I totally oh. The potassium. We're going to look at the potassium regulation in the renal system. And if you think about um, where potassium ion is, I want to ask you where it is. Is it in the cells or outside of the cells, most of it? Hmm? Inside, right. So if you eat something that is pretty rich in potassium, the extracellular potassium concentrations are going to spike. So the question is, why don't you die? We're going to answer to this question in the... Think about this. You eat like five bananas. Okay? They contain a lot of potassium. So technically speaking, your extracellular potassium should skyrocket and you should die because of the heart block. But it doesn't happen because your kidneys get rid of potassium. So maintenance of potassium levels in the extracellular fluid is extremely important. Does that make sense? So, sort of a, it's not a, a, a final summary because as we go further and further, we will see that all aspects of cardiovascular system are connected. But that flowchart provides 
need summary to regulation of cardiac act. You exercise. When you exercise, more blood returns back into the heart. Increased venous return. Increased venous return means increased end diastolic volume, which means increased stroke volume, which means increased cardiac output. Does that make sense? That train of thought. Okay. Lower heart rate, say, as a result of, of the exercise, or you are just relaxed. Lower heart rate allows more time for the heart to fill up with the blood, which also means higher venous return, and so on and so forth. When you exercise, and it turns out exercise is the best example to demonstrate the regulation of the cardiac activity. When you exercise, which system, which part of the nervous system gets stimulated? Sympathetic. Epinephrine increases contractility, force of contraction, which decreases end systolic volume, which increases the stroke volume. Okay? Does that make sense? Exercise will also decrease parasympathetic activity, which directly affects the heart rate. Does that make sense? So try to picture those steps. I don't, I don't ask you to co recover this um, flowchart completely. Okay, just think about this. Imagine that you are in a situation when your heart will race. Job interview. Okay? Job interview means what? You are stressed. You're nervous. You're stressed. Which system is stimulated? Sympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system, which neurotransmitter is produced in overwhelming amounts? Epinephrine. Epinephrine, what effect does it have on the heart rate? Yeah, makes it faster, right? What effect does it have on the contractility? Increases, right? So cardiac output will go up. Does it have any effect? When you are at the job interview and you're sitting in the chair, venous return, will it increase? No, you're not exercising, you're just sitting in the chair, right? You're not working out. So one important thing to understand is that for each situation it can be one two all three factors that will affect cardiac the the cardiac output does that make sense and the resulting effect is not determined by only preload or only afterload or only contractility or only heart rate it's a combination of factors but to check if you understand what we're talking about, I'm going to be asking you questions like this. If you administer epinephrine to the patient, it will increase the heart rate and increase cardiac output. Increase the heart rate, therefore decreasing cardiac output. So you have to pick the right answer out of four. Does that make sense? You have to understand the effects of, say, epinephrine and the consequences of those effects. Right? That's exciting. Congestive heart failure. Um, what is congestion? When you say the traffic is congested, I-90 is congested, what does that mean? Slow moving, lots of cars in the same place, right? That's what congestive heart failure is. When blood gets stuck in the part of the circulatory system. Okay? So why can it get stuck?
Excellent. Terrific. When ventricles aren't in sync. Okay? When one side pumps differently from another in terms of the volume per minute. Okay? Of course, you know, <laughs> it's not about one side decides, oh, I'm going to pump two times faster than another. Screw them. Okay? It's one side fail fails to pump. Does that make sense? Why one side can fail to pump properly? What can affect it? More specifically, think about the pump and the pipes. It can be a problem. Huh? Say again? Okay, valve, valve problems. So, valvular stenosis may prevent blood from going into the aorta. Excellent, aortic valve stenosis. Something else. Infarction, yeah. Heart doesn't work as well. Okay, so cardiac muscle isn't performing. Something else. It, uh, it will probably affect the entire heart. But I like the idea. So it can be failure of the bundles, let's say, Purkinje fibers on one side to deliver the signal. Nobody thinks about blood vessels. But what if blood vessels are horribly obstructed by the plaques? Right? So hypertension can cause the failure as well. Does that make sense? And vice versa, as we will see. So let's see. We have two sides. We have left side and right side. So if left side fails, left side delivers blood where? System. So if left side side becomes weak, it pumps less blood through the system. The word less means that there is some extra blood or it will get stuck. It pumps less through the system so that excess will go the pulmonary circuit, right? In the, well, not in, eventually in the lungs. I mean, yeah, it's going to be pulmonary edema, right? So it's going to be pulmonary congestion. When the left side of the uh, heart cannot pump, the extra blood will get stuck in the pulmonary circuit. Does that make sense? Uh, well, the, the problem is that when we talk about the cardiac, cardiovascular system, we talk step by step, but it's a flow, okay? No, 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 it's okay. Now think about this. Has anyone used the shuttles that go from main campus to Holden? Ideally, you have one shuttle at Holden, one shuttle at main campus, they meet in the middle, so there's always one shuttle five minutes away. I, when I teach at Holden, I use them sometimes. I stopped using them because what I can see is two shuttles at Holden and none of them at the main campus. And I don't want to spend 20 minutes waiting for them. I can walk in 10. Okay? So that's when the transport traffic becomes imbalanced. Right? So technically those, those shuttles become congested at Holden. But there is nothing the main campus. So when left side fails, less blood goes through the system and more blood gets stuck in the pulmonary circuit. Does that make sense? More blood means pulmonary hypertension, okay, and pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is associated also with the trafficking of red blood cells into the lungs. Red blood cells are not supposed to be in the lungs, so macrophages in the lungs will chop them up. Red blood cells contain a lot of iron, okay? And you can, if you take a, a, the biopsy of the lungs and you look at the lung tissue, you can see macrophages that are filled with iron, so-called heart failure cells, okay? Well, if the right side fails, and insufficient amount of blood goes into the pulmonary circuit, extra blood will get stuck in the systemic circulation. Does that make sense? 
more blood in the systemic circulation, hepatomegaly, because blood will accumulate, it will be the hepatic portal hypertension in liver will become larger trying to consume all those red blood cells, okay? Fibrotic changes in the heart and edema, okay? Pericardial edema, peritoneal effusion. So the fluid from the blood, because there's so much blood in the systemic circuit, it will seep out through the walls of the vessels into the peripheral tissues. Does that make sense? It's, that's pretty bad. It's pretty nasty. Okay. Now this, you may wonder, those pictures demonstrate. Well, that's pretty interesting. It shows you actually how the congestion can happen. So this is normal heart in the center. Okay. And two hearts with the hypertrophy. This heart on the left has no dilation. So it has cardiomyopathy, but no dilation. You see how thick the muscle of the left ventricle is? You see? Really extremely thick. So if this that thick, what's going to happen to the volume of the ventricle? It's lower, right? And if the volume of the ventricle is lower, EDV, it can't pump as much blood as it, as it used to. Does that make sense? What can, what can cause this muscle to be so thick? Yeah, exercise. <laughs> exercise. And, and one, not, not regular exercise, but when heart has to work too hard. Uh, why? And what happens in the systemic circuit? What, I mean, normally it doesn't happen. What should change in the systemic circuit so the heart will start, will have to work harder? Blood pressure, yeah. If the heart has to pump against a higher blood pressure, it's like a, a bodybuilder that increases the resistance of the exercise. That makes sense? The muscle will grow at the expense of the ventricular volume. So it's one case of cardiomyopathy. This exemplifies the dilated cardiomyopathy when size doesn't change, uh, sorry, the size of the muscle doesn't change, but the volume increases. You may say, uh, what's the problem? I mean, it's, it's good. Volume is bigger. Uh, the problem is that the muscle cannot um, effectively squeeze that much blood, okay? It's structurally not as solid as it used to. So dilated cardiomyopathy will also affect the ability of the heart to pump. Okay? Um, congestive heart failure on either side is, is bad. It's chronic disease. It's not reversible. Um, what can you do? If patient develops edema, you can remove the fluids. Um, try to reduce the blood pressure, to reduce the afterload. Okay. Um, give drugs to increase the force of contraction. Um, stem cells are being tested now. Well, they're being tested for everything, but in this case to maybe make new muscle cells. Okay, to improve the contractile function. That's about it. Um, I wanted, yeah, we're going to talk about disease a little bit, the cardiac disease. And I'm going to give you a quiz. If you don't finish it, don't worry. You can take it home and bring it on Wednesday. But that's, that's really exciting, the congenital heart disease. It's, it's a fantastic thing. So when heart develops, it starts as pretty much the, the tubes, two tubes that fuse together, okay, and they form four initial parts, the sinus venosus, so venous sinus, okay, the, the fetal structure that uh, precedes the, the vena cava. 
the atrium, one ventricle, one atrium. So not two sides, just one side, okay? And bulbous carditis, which will eventually become two large vessels. And by about five weeks post-conception, heart vaguely, well, close enough, reminding the adult heart. So you see a ventricle, okay? You see pulmonary trunk. You see aorta, superior and inferior vena cava, right? But the interesting thing is that pulmonary and systemic circuits in the fetal heart are not separated. Why? Pulmonary and systemic circuits in the fetal heart, in the heart of the fetus, while it's in the womb, circuits, pulmonary and systemic, are not separated. They exchange blood through the foramen ovale. Why circuits are not separated? What is the point in separating systemic and pulmonary circuit? Yes, we separate oxygenated blood from non-oxygenated blood in order to direct non-oxygenated blood to where? Yes. Why systemic and pulmonary circuits in the fetus are not separated? Lung, it doesn't use lungs. It doesn't breathe in a conventional way. Does that make sense? And at, cert at 35 days, lungs are not developed and they, he or she doesn't need that. Now, ideally, at the time a kid is born, okay, circuits are completely separated. Um, but that doesn't always happen, okay? Remember, we have right and left side, right side pumps into the lungs, left side pumps into the system. Inside of the heart, right and left side, do they communicate physically inside of the heart? Wait, wait. Inside. Think about the heart itself. Right and left side. Are they physically connected to each other? Are there any openings between the right and left side in the heart? No. They completely separated. That's how it's supposed to be. And if they not, we screwed. Okay? This is called a septal defect. Septal defect can be atrial, can be ventricular, or that can be a defect that, you know, the hole between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Okay? So atrial septal defect. The blood, in atrial septal defect, the blood, oxygenated blood, is lost from the left atrium to the right atrium. Does that make sense? In the ventricular septal defect, blood goes from left ventricle to right ventricle. And in so-called patent ductus arteriosus, the blood goes from aorta to the pulmonary Trunk. In all cases, you can imagine, it's mainly because of the differences in the pressure. Systemic pressure is higher. Okay. Now, what it creates? First and foremost, it creates pulmonary hypertension. To understand why. If extra blood goes to the right side, where does this extra blood end up? Pulmonary circuit, yes. So pulmonary hypertension. Now, if we lose some oxygenated blood, what will happen to the tissue oxygenation? Goes down, yeah. Less oxygenated blood is delivered to the tissue. Cyanosis. Okay. And then eventually it's going to be heart failure because of the increased after load. Um, hemodynamics, which means the blood flow. Okay, blood flow is altered in the heart. And that leads to the development of 
dilated hypertrophy or non-dilated hypertrophy. Uh, can it be fixed, do you think? Yeah, surgically it can be fixed. Absolutely. Okay. Um, shunts. Okay. Now, the right to left shunts, that's when the blood, for some reason, goes from right side to the left side. One example is classic tetralogy of the law. When you have ventricular septal defect, stenosis of the pulmonary trunk, okay, dilation of aorta, because it overrides the ventricular septal defect, and hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Okay. So essentially when you have um, this stenosis, the narrowing down of the pulmonary trunk, right ventricle becomes more um, developed, the muscle becomes more developed, so the, but the person develops hypertrophy, okay? Does that make sense? It's called tetralogy because there are four problems. Septal defect, stenosis, aortic dilation, and right ventricle hypertrophy. That's why it's called tetralogy. But honestly, what absolutely fascinates me in terms of the congenital pathology is the transposition of great arteries. So this is the right ventricle. Which great artery normally gets goes out of the right ventricle? Pulmonary trunk. In this developmental abnormality, pulmonary trunk and aorta are switched. So, aorta takes the blood out of the right ventricle. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't, but that's what happens. Now, let's see what happens. When blood leaves the right ventricle in this disease and gets in the aorta, where does it go? Which circuit? Systemic. And when it returns from the systemic circuit through the superior and inferior vena cava, where does it get into? Right atrium, and then right ventricle, and then which circuit? So you have two circuits, systemic and pulmonary, that are completely separated. Does that make sense? They are completely separated. When circuits, <clears throat> sorry, when circuits are completely separated, this condition is incompatible with life. Because blood, oxygenated blood from the lungs, does not reach systemic circuit. Does that make sense? Uh, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I don't think it's, it's a fetal problem. I mean, at the level of fetus, they should survive. But it probably can be diagnosed um, fairly, well, almost immediately after the birth, I would suppose. But this, what, what we described, is the transposition of great arteries without septal defect. Okay? With septal defect, the child has a chance to survive because there is an exchange of blood. You see? I mean, it's not a great <laughs> survival, but it's developmental and I don't think we know the exact mechanism. Okay, so most, those congenital problems are genetic. Okay. The last thing that I want to mention here is coarctation, the, the coarctation of aorta, okay? It's when aorta becomes stenosed. Does that make sense? Becomes narrower. 
and that also decreases the blood flow to the tissues. Another situation, when aorta becomes stenosed initially, so it's just too narrow, in some cases aorta can develop atresia, complete blockage, and that is very, you know, explains the poor circulation in the periphery and cyanosis in those patients. It also can be treated. Most those conditions can be treated surgically, but it's quite a, a complicated surgery as far as I can tell. Okay. Um, with age, a heart doesn't work any better. Okay. Efficiency decreases. So essentially, we develop the hypertrophy. Okay. Mass of the heart increases. Uh, what else? Usually we have a lot of microinfarctions. So more and more um, fibrotic tissue accumulates in the heart, which further decreases the pumping efficiency. Does that make sense? Um, what else? Accumulation of the fat deposits around the heart contribute to the inflammation and fibrosis. Um, valves can become affected, they can be stenosed, or they can be vegetations due to the you know, bacterial infections and inflammation. Um, the coronary circulation can become more convoluted, okay? Uh, plaques will accumulate. So generally speaking, even in the healthy people, okay, there will be damage associated with age, or it doesn't work any better with age only worse. Does that make sense? There's something I wanted to mention about this and I totally forgot. Well, anyway. <laughs>